Would you believe me if I said that no one will have to live with back pain in the future? This statement is clearly pushing our scientific, current scientific understanding, but since this is not a strict scientific talk, I think it's interesting to discuss the possibilities. So I'm a researcher, and I'm studying how and why we get back pain, and what we could possibly do to stop the pain, repair the structures, and even better, prevent back pain from happening in the first place. I'm sure you all know how debilitating back pain is, either from a personal experience or from seeing someone you know suffer. Back pain is actually the second most common medical condition in North America and worldwide. 80% of the population will suffer back pain at some point in their life and up to 15% of all Canadians suffer from chronic back pain. So it's clear that it has a very big negative impact on the quality of life of the affected person, and in the United States alone, it accounted for an estimated cost of $238 billion in 2013. But although it's so common and costly, very little is known about the mechanisms leading to back pain, and there is no treatment for early disease. So what I would like to do today is to tell you about the research that I'm involved in, but first we need to know a bit more about the spine. So the spine can be illustrated like a stack of donuts separated by spacers. <laughs> so my research focuses on the donut or the intervertebral disc, which is the correct term, which in short is IVD. The IVD is there to absorb the load that we put on our, our spine and to provide the trunk and the upper body with some flexibility. And we know that back pain is often related to failure of this structure, but why does it fail and why doesn't it heal like um, other tissues? So let's take a closer look at the donut. A donut, as we all know, has two parts. It's the jelly in the middle and the surrounding dough. So the jelly is called the nucleus pulposus, or NP, and the dough is called the annulus fibrosus, or AF. The jelly has a very high swelling potential. So if we put it in a liquid, it will double in weight. Or if it's completely free, it will expand five times its volume. So this is very important, and it explains why the structure has its shock-absorbing uh, properties. The dough is arranged like a reinforced tube. So it's made up of layers and layers of tissue that is arranged in a very specific way. So this gives strength, elasticity, and it prevents the MP jelly from swelling uncontrollably. But why does it fail, and why doesn't it heal like other tissues? Did you know that we are taller in the morning than in the evening? especially when we are young. And do you know why that is? Well, think about it. It's due to the swelling potential of the MP jelly. When we rest at night, liquid is absorbed into the sponge-like uh, jelly, and every one of our 23 donuts will increase a little bit in height, adding up to about one centimeter. Then in the day, when we put more uh, load on, on our spine, liquid is squeezed out again, we lose the gain height, and we become shorter. Another interesting and rare characteristic of this tissue is that there is no blood vessels or nerve fibers inside of the tissue. Both blood vessels and nerve fibers, they end in the very outer layer. So this explains to some extent why this tissue has such a poor regenerative capacity. And I will come back to this a bit later in my talk and give you some um, examples. Most research to treat human disease is done using animal tissue. This is important and it has given us a lot of important information, but sometimes human and animal tissues are different and they respond in a different way. So the team that I am uh, working with consists of engineers, uh, spine surgeons and biologists. And we are also extremely lucky to have a collaboration with Transplant Quebec. 
So this gives us access to human tissue, tissue from organ donors that consented for research. This collaboration is quite unique. There's only a few places in the world that have this opportunity. And it's only thanks to the organ donors and to the dedication of the coordinators at Transplant Quebec that we have this unique opportunity to study a human disease in human material. So I didn't know much about the spine when I joined the team about seven years ago. My task when I joined was to make sure that we could keep this tissue alive outside of the human body for long periods of time. In our initial experiments, we found that IVD cells can actually survive for more than 48 hours outside of the body. We could leave them in the fridge overnight and come back the next day, and they were still alive. This is quite rare. Most other tissue will die within a few hours without blood supply. But the IVD cells are used to very low nutrient supply since there are no blood vessels in the tissue. So this was good news to us. And it gave us some time to prepare the tissue. So we prepare the tissue and we put it in bioreactors that will compress and decompress the tissue. The idea with the bioreactors is that they will mimic a daily life situation and squeeze liquid out. And then when the load is removed, liquid and nutrients will come back into the tissue. And as I said, nutrients are needed for the cells to survive. And without nutrients, they will die. But as soon as we put the IVDs on the bioreactors and try to extend our experiments beyond three days, the cells started to die. And after a week, they were all dead. It was extremely frustrating. The device that was supposed to help actually killed the cells. So we concluded that we had to further develop our bioreactors. But in the meantime, I had to do something. So I decided to try without load and instead just improve nutrient supply into the tissue. And it worked. We were able to keep human IVDs alive outside of the body for more than four months. In the meantime, we continued to develop our bioreactors, and we were finally able to come up with a design that didn't kill the cells. And this was important to us because even though the cells survived, they were not as active as they normally would in the body. And our experiments would lack one important aspect um, of, of life. So we now have these bioreactors, and we can use them to ask a number of questions. So one thing that we were really interested in was to see what would happen if we exposed the tissue to injury. So we wanted to mimic uh, an accident where you have one injurious event to your spine. So one load at a very, very high speed. It was really surprising to see that one single overload was enough to start a degenerative cascade. We found that a lot of the jelly was lost from the tissue. We also found an increase in pain-mediating factors that leaked out of the tissue, factors that if they reach the surrounding nerves will cause severe pain. And these were the same factors that we had previously identified in IVDs of patients undergoing surgery for low back pain. So this type of injury is obviously not the only reason we get back pain, but it's certainly one. And I believe that by generating more knowledge about the, the things that lead to back pain will help us focus our research efforts on the uh, relevant pathways. So we then moved on, and we wanted to see if we could find an optimal loading or exercise re regime that would actually help to repair the tissue. But to be able to see if there was a positive effect of exercise, we first had to remove some of the jelly. So we divided our IVDs into three groups. So we had one group with no exercise, we had a heavy and a light exercise group. So the no exercise group they were just kept in a nutrient solution for the uh, period of the experiment. We exercised the other two groups with either a, a heavy or a light uh, exercise regime. We wanted to mimic a situation where an individual is active for two hours in the morning, then sits in front of the desk all day, has another two hours of physical activity 
in the afternoon, followed by a longer rest period at night. In these experiments, we found that the group that received the light exercise, they fully recovered, they refilled the jelly. Whereas the no exercise or the heavy exercise group both failed to recover. So our experiments cannot at this point be directly translated into a whole body situation. But it tells us that not enough or too much exercise is equally bad. And that there is a, a window of just the right amount that if it is applied at the right point of time can actually help intrinsic uh, repair. Like all tissues, the IVD age, and we lose the cells. So when we were a bit older, exercise alone will not be enough. But there is a lot of different treatment uh, ideas being tried, uh, tested around the world. So one is to add new cells into the tissue, like stem cells, for example. Another one is to inject a gel that will fill the void or refill the jelly, if you so want. There is also bioactive substances being tested that will stimulate the cells to produce more jelly. So I asked you in the beginning of my talk if you would believe me if I said that no one will have to live with back pain in the future. And perhaps, perhaps if we continue to do research, one day we will find the right exercise regime, the right cell-gel combination, the right stimuli to be applied at the right point in time. And, oh yeah, maybe even a jelly donut or two. Thank you. <laughs>